Expanding World in association with the Explorers Club are proud sponsors of this episode of Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, and the Global Exploration Summit, a pioneering endeavor bringing together the world's leading explorers, sharing cutting-edge technology and innovations to propel us toward the next frontier in the future of exploration and to make a difference in the future of humanity. Visit GlexSummit.com to learn more about the Global Exploration Summit and the impactful men and women who are the heart and soul of scientific innovation and exploration. One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Welcome to Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher for part two of Richard Garriott, space tourism pioneer, gaming's Lord British, and most recently, the first man to fly into space and go to the deepest point in the ocean. Again, you know, your your life is incredible, and I, we only have so many hours in a day. I want to take a little to that moment when you're ready to go in space. You know, obviously, your father, an astronaut, is a big influence in your life. And when you went for a launch, I've seen the video uh, of your father and your family on that launch pad. What is now going through your mind? You are strapped to a seat. You're on, you know, a vehicle that could explode. It's not out, out of the realm of possibility. But there had to be so many things at that moment that are going on in your mind you know, during that countdown. Yeah, well, you know, launch day is, uh, you, you, you've rehearsed it all many times, but it is profoundly different than any of the rehearsals. You know, you, you're you still getting up in the morning, putting on the you know, space suit that you put on already in rehearsal many times, but this time there's now a crush of press and family out you know, behind a glass wall. And you ride out to the launch pad and you've, you've, you've actually seen the rocket in pieces and you know, while it was being assembled just recently you know, before it was, the final assembly was stacked and put up on the pad. But you ride out to this vehicle that is now fully fueled, sitting on a launch pad. And when you walk up to it, not only is its enormity clear to you, but it is alive. It is full of cryogenic materials that are outgassing and valves are popping. The side is covered in frost. The, there is condensation streaming down the sides of it as it kind of creaks and groans. And you can, you, you can walk up and put your hand on this ex explosive animal. And that is a moment of awe, unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. Do you and, remember the last thing your dad said to you before you, you know, the last thing he said before you sort of went into there? Uh, you know, uh, he was there with me right as I walked up the ladder, but I don't think he said a single word. I do remember very well, I mean, this is very my dad. He, he, he put his hand on my shoulder, gave it a little tap and a little squeeze and a smile. That is sort of my dad's send off. And so that's, that's what I got at that moment too. And then as they take your first step onto the ladder, uh, one of the Russian generals gives you a kick in the butt, which is a, a bit of a rich, there's all kinds of Russian rituals. This one of them is you get kicked in the butt as you walk up the steps. And so I'd forgotten about it until it happened. You, you know, you get in this little rickety elevator that literally rickety and clinkety, clankety, clinkety, clankety, right up to the very top. And then you squeeze into this capsule that you've been inside of many times. You've been in other capsules a lot, but all the other simulation capsules, which are used capsules, they've cut out the hole in the side of it to make it easier to get in and out. And so this is the first time you're at the top of the stack, climbing in through a little hole, down through another little hole. I'm the first one to go in. So you're feeling around with your toes in the cold and the dark, hoping to not knock anything off that makes you have to get out and have somebody go back in and fix it. So you're being very, very careful. 
And I am actually the person who turns it on and brings it to life. So the, you know, turn on the first power button, all the displays come to life. How turn on the lighting or all the oxygen. How exciting is that? Totally. And I'm literally the only one in the rocket. And only after I get everything configured, do I then use the radios to tell the people back on the outside when I'm ready now for the, my crewmates to come in. And so, uh, yeah, so that part is awesome. And, but one of the funniest moments comes when, uh, after you're all, you've gone through all your checklists and the machine is now configured. And so in theory, you could launch in five minutes. However, there's a hold in the countdown for almost an hour. But in rehearsal, you never bother sitting there for the one hour hold. So the first time ever, you stop and do nothing for an hour is launch day. And so you get to this hold and you're like, oh, oh yeah, I, I guess, you know, I guess we're gonna sit here for a while. And so at first you have some conversation with your crewmates. You go like, all right, fist bump, we're going. We know nobody can stop us now. Woo, we're getting ready to go. <laughs> and then, you know, that lasts a few minutes. And you're like, okay, you know, hey, let's think about the families out there biting their nails, gonna see what's going on. You get, that gets tired, you get tired of that one. And so then you actually fall asleep. So all three of us just, it just, you know, snooze, because what else are you going to do? You're strapped in this seat for an hour. And, and at that point, the people in mission control turn on like this elevator music. Da, da, da. It's like Herb Alpert you know, with the radio. And we all just break out laughing, you know, just because we're all just just waiting. And then finally, at the end of this hour, the Capcom gets on and says, OK, here we go. It's immediately, your, your body switches modes again. You go through those last five minutes of checklists and, you know, and, and and the next amazing moment is the, the moment of launch, which is completely different than I had anticipated. Because in the United States, we bolt our vehicles down until the thrust is at its maximum rate and every, all the engines are lit and everything's running fine. And then we explosively release those bolts. And so that rocket begins to go at full acceleration from the first moment it is moving. In Russia, it's not that way. In Russia, it's actually gravity holding the rocket down onto some brackets that are holding it just above the midpoint of its center of gravity. And so as soon as the rocket engines have given thrust greater than the mass of the rocket, the rocket begins to lift, but imperceptibly. And so when you get to the point of liftoff, I expect to feel something and you feel nothing. And so you're going like, oh, what, did, did, the, did the engines light? Are we actually moving? And you don't have time to stop and ask because you're still doing your checklist. And then a few moments later, you begin to feel the gravity increase, the pressure in your chest begins to build and build and build and build and build until there's basically, you know, an elephant sitting on your chest. And so you're going like, okay, we are really, really moving now. And so, uh, 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 but, but the transition into flight uh, was, was completely different than I had anticipated. You know, it's interesting because if I drive my car and you drive it enough times or if somebody flies an airplane, I remember an astronaut, Story Musgrave, who you know, saying that he could hear the sounds of, of vehicles that he were, was flying and he could tell how they were performing. At any point in that launch, are you saying that's not a groan or a, a sound that I thought I would hear? Was there any point where you go, I hope this is right? Or, or are you thinking it's all going smooth at that point? Uh, on the way up, it all seemed very smooth. Um, my job, by the way, on the way up, one of my jobs was that I had the emergency procedures manual. And as you go through launch, you, after you get to a certain point, the abort procedure means to do one kind of thing. And after another point in the flight, it's a different set of instructions if there was an abort. And so I am thinking about abort a lot. And so I am thinking about you know if there's an abort here and this and the escape tower fires we're gonna feel a jolt and i will need to be on page five and so i and so i'll you know i have my other book going to page five so uh and then later it turned to page 10 you know so i'm i'm sort of keeping the emergency procedures up to date while i'm also doing a few other checklist items but there was never there was never any part of that that i that i that seemed off i was always paying attention but nothing ever seemed off that was actually not true for reentry and even in one, one time on orbit, that we actually had a fire alarm go off while I was on orbit that made us go through some emergency procedures, which turned out to be nothing. And on reentry, we actually had multiple malfunctions. And the two previous Soyuz reentries before mine had very serious malfunctions. So we, were, we, we didn't have that particular malfunction, but we had others. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, malfunctions though, 
are something that, again, having grown up with it, really helped because I realized, having listened in on those squawk boxes, that malfunctions happen all the time and there's procedures for them. And, you know, they've all been worked before, whether they really had ever happened or they were theorized to have to be able to happen, there is a procedure for it. And so I actually felt very comfortable with all the procedures, even through the malfunctions I experienced, because there were things we had trained for. I mean, it, it almost seems like a metaphor for life. Life, you're going to have malfunctions and there's always a procedure to get out of it. So the question I have is, so in fact, you and I, I think we're part of the same discussion with Buzz Aldrin talking to him when he walked on the moon. And one of the things that always struck me talking, especially to Buzz Aldrin, was the lack of an emotional connection to what he was doing. He was very driven by procedures. And when you ask him, I've even asked him, when you look up at the moon, what do you think? And he goes, nothing really all that much because I was so focused on the mission. Is there any point in that mission where you get a little teary-eyed and say, oh my God, I'm here? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, but by the way, uh, but I'm going to rewind to a letter I got from uh, Alan Bean, who was another person who walked on the moon and flew with my dad on Skylab. When he heard that I was flying, oh, and another thing to point out about Alan Bean, he's an artist. Uh, I should say he became an artist at post-flight. I'm not sure how much of an artist he was pre-flight. He became a very, very good artist. Um, his pieces sell for you know enormous amounts of money. Uh, and uh, Alan wrote me one of the nicest letters I've received, which he said, hey, Richard, I'm thrilled that you're getting this chance to go. One, I know you've wanted to go forever. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's at long last. I know you're fulfilling a live stream. But he also said, it's also really important that you or people like you go. Because while your father and I were these Spock-like characters that frankly did not do that great a job verbally relating this experience in, in an inspirational way with others, I know you well, and I know that you are, you describe things passionately about anything you do with great, or any small or big thing you do, you describe with an amazing level of passion. So he said, it's actually going to be really good that you go for others, that, that, it will, that will help us communicate what's, what's happening. And, and so when you ask about the emotional thing that happened uh, uh, up in space, it's interesting that, you know, people would often ask, you know, what advice did your father give you? And the answer is uh, not much. And uh, my, if they asked my father that, he would say, I didn't give him any advice. He actually knew everything he needed to uh, go before he went. But he had already been a mentor, Richard. I mean, he had been a mentor. Oh, no, of course he has. But there is, actually one, there is actually one thing that he did that is particularly important, which is he actually said, and this, he said it this dispassionately. He said, you know, the one thing that you will remember for the rest of your life is the view of the earth out the window. And so when we are planning your schedule of activities on orbit, because I had a very heavy workload, one of the things I did was actually took on a very heavy experiment load and commercial payload work the load. He said, if it's daylight and you're over a continent, I'm gonna either have you in free time to look out the window, or if you're doing some work, it'll be work that you can do at the window because that's, that's the most important thing for you to do. And if it's nighttime uh, or you're over the Pacific where there's nothing to see, uh, we'll do some other work elsewhere. And he ran my mission control team and did my whole schedule, both originally and live in real time as it needed adjustment. And, uh, and of course, you know, when you get up into space, one of the first things I found about looking out the window is just how captivating it is to look at the earth out that window. And what's fascinating about that is that, you know, it's not that dissimilar from either you know, putting a full screen, you know, uh, uh, Google Maps, you know, with satellite view on and scroll it, or some of the great movies done by IMAX movies of literally putting an IMAX camera in space, looking back at the earth. I mean, those, an IMAX movie of looking back at the earth is for screenshot for screenshot, as good as you see by eye. <laughs> but being there in person provides this immediacy that what you're seeing you know, even in an orbit later, you're going to process, you're not going to see this spot again, maybe ever. It's incredibly, you know, 250 miles up, while that seems like a long way up, it's still very intimately close. So you, you have both the ability to see horizon to horizon around the globe of the earth, and it is round. And, uh, and but you're also close enough to the earth that you can see details all the way down to highways and bridges. Uh, and so it feels like there's this fire hose of information about the world we live in just pouring into your mind by just staring out the window. And so you see things like, 
uh, the edges of all the tectonic plates, you know, which are kind of cool to see the ring of fire, et cetera. You see how weather forms and interacts with land masses and how heat from volcanoes punches little holes in the clouds and uh, how, you know, over the Pacific, you get these, these fractal or laminar, you know, fronts that move across because there's no change of temperature or land mass to interact with. But over the Atlantic, uh, and especially over the Gulf, which is shallower and warmer and has a lot more land, you get much more chaotic things, including all the formation of all the uh, hurricanes. You know, you see all the soil or pollution rivers are carrying out into the oceans and the big plumes of either pollution or soil that they're making. You wonder about whether that's pollution or soil or some mix. And you think about the dead zones that the deoxygenation, uh, you know, due to fertilizers in the water and things. You, all these things that you hear in the news, you're now seeing directly and you're going, you're trying to put it all together. And you're seeing how we're pumping up fossil water in every desert on earth and how there's roads in every desert on earth and there's roads through every forest on earth and there's passes of roads on every mountain range and uh, dams on every river. And you, you can see all the pockmarks of uh, the meteor strikes all over the earth. And you're just, you're just glued to this, this experience out the window. And after you make about a hundred orbits, something profound happens, which only after my flight, I have learned that it was called the overview effect. But it really took seeing this buildup that I've just taken you through before this moment can happen. And for me, it happened when I happened to travel over Austin, Texas, was where I was living at the time. As I grew up in Houston, I could see it out the window also, the Gulf Coast where I had you know, gone to the beach many times. I had hiked and biked and explored this area in detail. So I knew this area like the back of my hand. I knew its scale and I knew its detail. And at the same time, I could see the rest of the earth that I'd just been around a hundred times paying very close attention. And suddenly I realized I now know the scale of the earth by direct observation. And suddenly at that moment, I had a physical reaction, literally shuddered, the hair stood up on the back of my arm, uh, uh, the visuals seemed to change like in a movie, scary movie where they'll dolly the camera back but zoom the lens in so the actor stays the same size but the hallway sort of comp compresses. The earth didn't change size out the window but your conception of space just collapses. And it was a very emotional, very physical, instantaneous moment that has persisted for the rest of my life to where my sense of the size of the earth, the importance of uh, environmental attitudes, uh, the importance of being a, a part of the solution, sort of an activist part of the solution versus just standing on the sidelines, all those the aspects of my life changed at literally that moment. You know, it sounds like at that point too, there's a chapter of thinking of, of Richard Garriott. You know, you and I are friends, and I always kid you that you're the next branch of human evolution of, of thinking. Do you think at that point it's now doing something within some res recess of your brain, whether it be spiritual? You know, how did that moment change you now in the way you even think or approach things? Well, you know, it, it is interesting that, you know, um, uh, as explorers, you know, one of the things that I, I think is great about all our brethren, all within our fellowship, is sort of the realization that, you know, while uh, the famous firsts that, uh, you know, that hang on the walls of our, of our club uh, were accomplished by the generation before us, that there is an enormous amount of exploration yet to be done both in the grand and in the small. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, I, I worked hard to and, and had to, frankly, you know, uh, uh, find excuses to be believed that I was a worthy explorer to get myself into the Explorers Club and, uh, and have found it, literally every one of our fellow members to be incredibly accomplished and inspirational. Uh, often, and again, going both from the great and the small, you know, whether it's folks like Fred McLaren talking about his taking submarines under the North Pole and punching up through the ice. He's the real deal. Uh, he's, the real, he's, the, he's the real deal of the, of the generation ahead of us, for real. Uh, or the people that are, you know, uh, using satellite telemetry to study ancient riverbeds in Africa uh, and then map out the moving, movement of the sand dunes 
to find when those riverbeds are exposed under the theory that if there was fresh water there, there must have been civilization there, which there was, as they go find lost cities that have never been discovered before. All the way down to something I love to participate in, which is uh, you know, microbes, all the extremophile microbes that on almost every trip that I make now, I bring back a vial full of mud and we find new life forms that have never been. I have been on one of those digs with you. And uh, it was interesting. You and I were in a fossil pit and yeah. you took uh, a layer of iridium from 65 million years ago. Yep. And you say it's it's on your wall somewhere. I'll ha have to come yep. and see that. In a case, Richard, I, I've got to ask you. So I, I know that the um, Russians or the so former Soviets land differently. NASA astronauts, they splash down in water. They plunk um, to the ground. Oh, yeah. All right. You go you go through that. And, and you know, that's got to be a whole story onto itself. But I did see a video of the crew that did come to pop the hatch and greet you. And in that group was your father. What's that? Take me to that moment there. You look up and you see his face. What are you thinking? Well, you know, so what's amazing is that not only did I get to um, you know, work with my father on preparing for the flight. I mean, almost all the experiments that I was involved in, my dad helped uh, either make the connection or even help design or facilitate the experiment in some detailed way. So we worked, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it, it, just the preparation for this flight was an, a father-son opportunity, unlike I'd ever had previously as father and son. Then he was there with me as I boarded the rocket for launch. He ran my mission control team the whole time I was in space. Uh, and uh, he left mission control two days early to come out to the landing site and was there literally within 120 seconds of the impact because uh, we only landed 500 meters off the mathematically predicted spot. So they were right there as we landed. Uh, and, so, and so it was a joy. I mean, and to me, the greatest joy was seeing the joy in his eyes. Uh, you know, I, I was... I was, you know, potentially disappointed to be back on Earth because I was having such a good time in space. Uh, but, uh, uh, but seeing saw the video, your dad had a big smile on his face. Big, I mean, you could smile. not help but see pride. So totally, you look up at your father. I mean, I don't think you have a heart as a human if you can't feel that emotion, that pride on both of you. Yeah. Well, and also, what's also fun for this, and this is something my siblings uh, rib me about all the time, which was growing up. I was sort of the black sheep of the family in the educational sense. Both of my older brothers were straight A students and super accomplished. Uh, my younger sister also a basically straight A student, super accomplished. And I was never, a, I wasn't even a B student. I was mostly a C student, occasionally a few Ds in college one F. Uh, and, and, I would, and then I dropped out to go play games for a living. And, and as much as that sounds uh, like, yeah, but who cares? It did seem to matter in my family. It, it really was one of these things where I got a lot of pressure from especially dad about my lack of performance in what seemed focus, like- right? Focus, right? Focus. Focus. Focus, focus, focus. And, and so I sort of had this journey with my dad's, you know, where- Obviously, the business stuff was doing very well. So he clearly respected the fact that, okay, he's, he's devoting an enormous amount of energy into this. He's doing this at you know, a level of creativity and, and, and polish that no one else is. <clears throat> and so this, the service is clearly deserved. But he was also like, this can't last. I mean, this has to be a windfall. This is going to, you know, two or three years is going to end and you're going to go back to school and finish your degree and go get a real job. And then it went on for 10 years and then 20 years and then 30 years. But there had never been sort of this moment of reckoning of, yeah, okay, Richard, Richard is uh, uh, as good as, uh, from a ca career commitment standpoint, as my two traditional older brothers. But the space flight changed that. And in fact, my, my, my brothers especially would all go like, oh, yeah, that's when, you know, they were the favorites before, but... We they lost out. They lost that position to me. Well, that's a tough one to 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 beat, Richard. I mean, you're also in your 40s, but it, you know it's interesting that your early failures might have spurred on success because Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player ever, cut in in tenth grade from his high school basketball team, only to be uh, you know in the NBA like four or five years later. I remember having a conversation with Sir Edmund Hillary, first guy to climb Mount Everest. And he said when he was 12 years old and he moved to a new school, because he was so skinny and his ribs were sticking out, that they put him sort of in a special ed class for kids 
who weren't physically up to snuff. And I think with those individuals, that whole idea of being an imposter that, you know, I'm, I'm really only gaming this. I'm not worthy of it. I'm only succeeding because of a lot of things. That has to play a little bit of a role in your eyes, in, in, or at least in, in your mind. No, no, I think you're unquestionably right. Um, the, uh, uh, you, you know, as I, as I look back on it, even, um, uh, you know, even now at a, a, a place we, we, we share a love of, the Explorers Club, you know, I go back and forth between feeling like an imposter there and feeling like actually I, I know that I am uh, a worthy uh, uh, member. Uh, just, because, just because, again, we have, you know, there is not one person you can sit down with at that club where you, you, there, there's people I see four or five times and, you know, I don't have any reason to pick them out of a crowd as being particularly special for one reason or another. And I've got a lot of other things to do, so I don't bother talking to them for two or three times I've seen them. And then we happen to be sitting at the bar sometime and they're sitting at the next stool. So I go like, all right, you know, uh, I think I've got some fun stories, but I want to hear your fun stories. And they'll start and I'm going like, oh my God, you know, every person is that way. There's, it's, it's a, uh, and, and even though I'm, and I'm, and I'm lauding the Explorers Club, but I, but I actually even think that if you take that to the general public, my, my, one of my learnings as a game developer is gamers, of course, also come as from, in all, from all stripes, right? There are, your uh, classic computer nerd gamers, and in modern times, all the sports guys are gamers too, and, uh, uh, and in fact, all movie stars are gamers too. And but after a while, you kind of realize, oh yeah, everybody's a gamer. But until you sit down and talk to people and really kind of hear, like, hey, what brought you to this space? I mean, and in, in, in my case, for meeting a lot of gamers, I'm meeting people who have played my game, so they're wanting to come talk to me. But if you turn the tables on, I go like, okay, thank you, know, thank you for, I appreciate the fact you played my games. You know, what are the games, what brings you here? And when you, when you ask other people about their lives, you quickly realize everybody's had a pretty damn interesting life. You know, I mean, every, all of us- have oh, Richard, I think you're, you're up there, Richard. I mean, you know, and, and one of the things that has always struck me about you, and you know, you and I speak often, we speak at least once a week, if not more, how normal you are. For example, I remember this past Thanksgiving, you sent, you texted me your Thanksgiving table, which you cooked the turkey and, and did the design on that. And it was remarkably like a Norman Rockwell photo. So for a guy who's, you know, made millions in the gaming industry, gone into space, yet I have seen you in, in incredibly normal things. Yesterday, you and I were talking before this interview. And uh, again, in, in your world, you're invited to the uh, presidential inauguration and you're trying to figure out babysitters. So here you are trying to figure out your kids' schedules, which seems like a pretty darn normal thing to me. And yet you've done all these things. I think maybe if I were to give you uh, an attribute of greatness is just the um, perspective, something your mother used in a different term. You have such a wonderful perspective on life, the individuals who inhabit it, and, and sort of your goals. And maybe that is the combination of your mother's art background and, and your father's science in, in melding it in, in a way that came out so well. So, Richard, if I just first of all, thank you for that those words. But I, I do want to throw one more piece in that. In addition to my parents, who I think are a big part of that, I, I also think it it was helpful to maintain that perspective by having both achieved and lost. You know, when you get one of these kicks in the pants, that you know you you lose it all literally. And, and whether you mean money or just, you know, there was a period of time where every game that I did was a number one bestseller, but there's also been periods of time where I was not in the top 10 game after game. And there was a time, you know, where I thought all my best friends loved me. And there was a time where they all gave me their talking to you about, Hey, don't be a jerk. And, and I think, I think having both the rises and the falls really helps. Uh, just like, again, to go back to the Explorer side, you know, knowing who you want to take with you on a potentially hazardous expedition is a really important question. And by the way, they manage that on space flights very carefully. They have a, they have a psychologist follow you all through the training just to keep an eye on you to make sure that if the shit hits the fan, that you're not going to be the one that, 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 makes, that makes it worse 
uh, that instead you'll at least remain calm and hopefully problem solve. Time and space to time in life, you know, who you choose as your partners seems incredibly important and who you choose no, oh, as exactly friends. right. And, um, uh, uh, you, you know, and, um, uh, and, and, and then the same vein, realizing that, uh, you know, you within your team, within your expedition team, you know, you need to make sure you have all the skills you'll need covered. You know, you need to make sure somebody can operate the radios, somebody can, you know, manage to get our scavenge our food. If we, if we get stuck in the woods, you know, hope we have a hunter with us or whatever might be needed. And, um, uh, and then after that, go like, you know what? Once I know that we have those covered and no one is going to, be a danger well then you accept everybody as they are you know everybody's got quirks everybody's got uh, uh you know some of my, almost all of my favorite stories about trips like we were when we were down in the volcano recently i think you know last year i went down in a, a messiah volcano in nicaragua and uh you know one of the guys that was running cables for us was this old guy that had been down there running cables for years and was a uh a, a, had a you know he was in his 70s but had a teenage girlfriend and you know, we're just going like, wow, this guy's just, he's just, he's just from another period of time and, and, and not necessarily in all in compl in fully complimentary ways, but he was, but he was such a genuine and nice character that, uh, and his skills to do the important rigging that we needed at the time was unquestionable, uh, that, you know, it just, it just, it just really enhanced the whole journey to be there with these characters who are competent and, uh, uh, and actually nice, sincerely nice people. And so, you know, that's what, you know, that's, that's what you look for in, in friends and partners and explorers. Richard, we just have like a couple minutes and I'm going to maybe do some rapid questions. And uh, would you ever go back in space? Oh, I hope to go any, many times. I hope as soon as I can. Okay. Who is the toughest person you ever met? You know, who was the mentally toughest person you ever met? Oh, yeah. You know, it's um, uh, my, I would say my two favorites are Alexei Leonov, who we sadly recently lost and uh, an Italian uh, uh, astronaut, Luca uh, Palantano, I'm gonna get his, that's sorry, his last name is a bit off, but um, Alexei Leonov is the first person who had done a spacewalk. And if you listen to his tale about being stuck on the outside and not fitting back through the hatch to be able to live alone in space, um, you know, it really, it's, it's, it's a harrowing tale that, you know, it, it's hard to imagine facing that myself. And with Luca, uh, you know, he he had his heating and cooling vest that run, has a little basically uh, like uh, hoses from a fish tank running through it, running hot and cold water to m regulate your temperature. Uh, he had one of those lines burst and fill his helmet with water. So he was drowning at the International Space Station while on a spacewalk. Um, you know, th those guys, the the calm, collected, methodical way they got themselves out of those phenomenally dangerous circumstances uh, are probably my, my two most admired moments. Any, any heroes outside the space industry? Well, I think, you know, common to our uh, clan, uh, Ernest Shackleton is by far my number one. Uh, in fact, as soon as I read the book South, which was early in my personal journey into exploration, um, you know, and, I, I'm, and I'm a collector anyway. I mean, I collect medieval arms and armor and antique scientific instruments and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I have a Shackleton collection, which is also uh, significant and is occasionally called on to be placed in museums and things that are doing Shackleton exhibits. So, uh, you know, I, I just find both the reality as well as the mythology uh, about him and how he pulled these things off to be astounding. You and I shared um, an evening with uh, I believe nine living Apollo astronauts last year. That was a pretty incredible moment to have all those people. And, and you emceed a, 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 the group of them in discussion. I'm kind of curious, out of those nine, was there anybody who sort of struck you as sort of a favorite or best of the best? Uh, well, Rusty Schwackert, who's still, you know, uh, all those guys are up there in years, 70s and 80s. Yeah. And, uh, but, but Rusty is... Uh, one, one of my favorite astronauts in the sense of, you know, while a lot of the guys were either uh, military uh, test pilots and so sort of have that 
attitude. So in addition to my, my dad was in the first group of scientists. They're the Spock guys. Uh, the, the, the Mercury folks were the test pilots. And so they sort of have a, yeah, you know, kind of, they have a hard, fast driving, hard riding kind of attitude uh, in, in their minds. And that's what a lot of those Apollo guys are too. But Rusty is an interesting character in that he's one of the few of that era that loves to just sit down and go, oh, hey, let's, you don't know how this thing worked? Let's sit down together and let me show you how it worked or let's talk about how it went. Or, um, you know, he, 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 is, he, is, he both has the historical perspective and he is a completely modern thinker in the sense of he has evolved with the times, unlike, uh, you know, my father and many of the others who, who might've gotten a little stuck in there. In their but time. Rusty's still working on things. Rusty's, I, I think, working on a project to look at uh, meteorites or asteroids that might hit the earth. So, I mean, And, and other folks, and, and now working uh, with uh, us at the Explorers Club, and uh, you know the uh, yeah. So he's still very very active, uh, and uh, and and I also liked how uh, his answer during that panel it struck me the the best when my my daughter Kinga uh, got to ask the final question, and her question to the panel was, "Why are there not any women up there on that stage?" And uh, one of the other astronauts uh, answered. Well, you know, the job back then was pretty tough and, you know, only us male test pilots were really up to the task and, and Rusty properly put him in his place and said, no, Kinga, it's because we weren't as smart back then as we are now, <laughs> uh, which for which he got a, you know, a, 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 a ovation. And, and Richard, the last question, um, parenting, that's a whole other skill set that maybe isn't so easy to game. What's the uh, toughest aspect and, and maybe what's the best aspect of being a parent? Wow, you know, that's, so what, what's interesting about that is uh, I, I waited till I was literally 49.9 years old. I was, it was three days prior to my 50th birthday when I got married. Uh, my wife said, I won't marry you if we wait till you're after 50 because she was still in her 30s at that time. And so I had kids pretty late. And so one thing I still reflect on is if I had had kids at a younger age, I actually don't think I could have or would have done a lot of the things I did manage to do because they, uh, it, it would have been difficult to have accomplished the things I managed to do if I also had kids around. That being said, boy, I wouldn't trade the kids for the world in the sense of, I think it is, you know, one of the greatest joys at all is going and playing with my kids and watching their minds grow. But then also one of the toughest aspects of it is being analytical as self-analytical as a parent to going like, am I really providing them the right level of nurture, the right level of uh, opportunity versus grittiness? Yeah, it's it's actually really, um, you know, the fact that all of us as parents do it, you know, you know one cycle, you know, one group of kids generally, and uh, uh, and with no with no real training, uh, and now I'm, you know, I'm I'm semi-retired professionally. So I have actually more time than most during this time of COVID where most people are having to juggle being in a, somehow working, whether it's in your office or via Zoom and Skype, uh, or uh, the kids manage the kids being at home through online learning, et cetera. It's incredibly complicated. And, uh, and, and I have an easier time of it than most. And so I, I'm just in awe of the fact that you know, we haven't killed more of our children on accident, you know, just uh, through bad parenting in this period. I, I think you'll do a good job. Richard, I have to say, I, I, you and I speak often, so um, it's not like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity that we're, we're meeting for the first time. But I, I say this really on all corners of my heart. It has been a pleasure. And I, I think of you and I think the world is a better place for having a Richard Garriott in the world. So thank you for being on Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. Well, thank you very kindly, Richard. Uh, as you know, it's a mutual admiration society here. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, working with you uh, uh, with the Explorers Club, uh, the alma mater we both uh, share and love and uh, you know, look forward to continued days of exploring together. Yeah, I, I think good things are in store for you, Richard.